pro-life group, a group that is working uh, with the March for Life. They are working in arenas of politics and adoption and foster care. And we have the National Review Institute Senior Fellow, Catherine Jean Lopez. Catherine, how are you? Good, good to be on. Thank you. Thank you so much. And let's let's just talk about um, just at some of the fundamental groups of, you know, what you guys do at the NRI and how it relates to uh, the pro life movement and adoption, foster care, and that kind of thing. Sure, sure. So na- the National Review Institute is is sort of the nonprofit um, sister of National Review Magazine, and I've been at National Review for for 21 years now. And um, what we do at the National Review Institute is we've been able to take some of the editors and writers who have been at National Review for a while who do other things besides write articles, um, uh, talk about some, or or, or sort of activists on particular issues or do mentoring of journalism, fellows, something Kevin Williamson, my colleague, does. Um, lots of different things. David French, one of my colleagues, is a lawyer who does a lot of free speech sure. um, uh, issues, and so that's something he gets to focus more on. And in my case, we have um, a center for religion, culture, and civil society that I direct, and the idea is that I'm able to shine a light on a lot of groups on the front lines of um, of some of these issues. And, and in the last year or so, we've been particularly um, focused on uh, adoption and foster care. Um, knowing that, um, realizing that it's an area that um, pro-lifers and conservatives could afford to be talking a lot more about. Um, we've got a, a crisis in, in, in foster care, um, you know, modern-day orphans here in the United States and most of our communities um, that we need to be thinking a little bit more about. And, and I am so moved, I, I have to say, um, once people are aware of the generosity that the families um, have, um, their, the openness they have to considering um, whether or not they might have a call to um, to adopt or be foster parents, is really beautiful. Now, not everyone is called to it, um, but um, when you start, when people start thinking on a, a parish by parish, church by church, community by community kind of basis. Okay, what more could we do? Which is going to include some some families can open their homes to a child um, temporarily, maybe to even keep um, a child out of the foster care system, be a safe haven for. Um, there's a program called Safe Families um, that that has been um, very active in evangelical churches and, and Catholic churches are now um, picking it up in, in Los Angeles and. In a particular way, I'm uh, aware of, um, and the idea is that if if um, if a mother say has to go into detox for for a month or so um, and doesn't have any family nearby, there's going to be somebody in in her in the community who can be a safe family um, and and uh, take take her her child in for a little while so she doesn't have to get caught up in the foster care system. So anyway, we, we've been focusing a lot more on those areas in, in the last year and plan a conference um, in Washington in, in the coming months, um, among other things. So really, you're hitting the bullseye for in, in two-pronged ways of something that's so dear to my heart. One, in a personal arena that when my wife and I had, uh, you know, I'm a pastor now, and we've been married for just under 20 years, and we had kind of felt called to uh, pursue some adoption and look into it because of our past and things that we had made mistakes long before we found God, and we had been divorced, and we kind of didn't qualify for certain programs. It was just a, it was just so much red tape. And then, more importantly, it seems like now more than ever, when we're having pro-life discussions, we're having um, abortion discussions, one of the first things a lot of activists try to say is, well, yeah, but you guys need to do a better job of taking care of the kids that we already have a problem with. Yeah, you're right. So your group is is really there on the ground trying to help guide folks in the right direction. And you just said it. You, you're seeing an incredible response when people find the need, right? Foster care, adoption, you, you, you know, this is definitely part of the pro-life group, and you've seen the reaction from the communities. Exactly. It really is a beautiful thing to see um, how many people want to um, step up to the plate once they realize what's going on. 
there was a, a panel discussion I'd like you to speak about, and that's called uh, Love Saves Lives. And I know that um, it, it really just is at the crux of really what we're talking about. Um, oh, so the March for Life last uh, last week in mm-hmm. Washington, mm-hmm. Um, the mm-hmm. theme was Love Saves, saves Lives. Right. And, um, and so I moderated a panel for the, the March for Life has a, a convention, an expo, they call it, the day before. Okay. Um, the, the actual march. And, and I've been moderating a panel for like the last five years or so, um, in the same venue. And, and the idea is that we highlight people who are leaders on the ground. Um, and, uh, so we had Kelly Rosati from Focus on the Family talking about foster care. Um, she herself is, is, uh, her and her husband are, are foster, um, parents who have adopted. And talk so beautifully about all of the issues that come up. But I mean, there's trauma that you're dealing with that that these children have experienced, and and there's such a need for support around the family um, because there are extra challenges that come with that, obviously. And in particular, in in her case, they have a number of children with a number of different stories and traumas and. And um, so, so things are always coming up, and and she speaks with such joy at the same time about about um, all all of the love and the hope that they've um, these children have brought to their lives, even with the challenges, um, as it is with with all children and and all families. Sure, absolutely. And, um, it, it really, really is just a tremendous topic that we really haven't even pulled back the onion apart yet. Really, right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean. Um, Folks, we're talking with Catherine Jean Lopez. She's part of National Review Institute and kind of uh, was a participant in the, one of the panel discussions for March during the March for Life last week, talking about uh, some of the, the different spins on the pro-life topic. I know we talk about it here on the show a lot, and that and this one in particular, adoption and foster care. And National Review has really done a great job of putting together um, a lot of pieces from a lot of different authors. A few of my favorites were among the list I know that have written uh, pro-life group. And you guys can put that together and was made available. It's it's called a pro-life reader. Talk a little bit about that, and um, you know what it really kind of was. Dri- what was kind of put together to drive what kind of message? Sure. Well, uh, as I mentioned, I, I mean I've been going to the March for Life of it for probably a quarter of a century now, and um, and I uh, in recent years I'm always speaking at events around the March for Life. And um, some people know National Review, and 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 some people sort of know it in passing. Other people are are fully fully appreciate the wealth of articles that that appear on life issues um, through the years at National Review, and um, and currently. Um, and um, so so anyway, for all of these people, I always wanted to give them something, you know, mm-hmm. um, whether it's a thank you for support or come see what what we have to offer here. Um, so, so I put together this this pro life reader, which has really articles from throughout the years that were established in 1955, um, uh, from William F. Buckley Jr. to some of our our youngest writers now. Um, and the idea was just to cover a, a wide array of some of the life issues. Um, and so, so many pieces hit the cutting room floor. Let me tell you, um, because we had so much to choose from, which was a great. Great blessing, and and I found too. Speaking to your point about we haven't even pulled the the layers off the onion. Um, uh, we had we had a piece I think in 1993 by Marvin Alasky on adoption, and it remains so relevant in a lot of depressing kind of ways. To be honest with you, um, and and in many ways I, I've. I've considered over the last couple of years as we've focused more on the foster care and adoption, it's a little bit of an examination of conscience for me and for I think it should be the whole pro-life movement and the conservative movement because we don't talk enough about this. And so I find myself when when I'm talking about it and I'm bringing in experts, they just overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly thank me for the little I'm doing, as far as I'm concerned, there's so much more that needs to be said and done, um, because because so often we overlook the issues, we don't talk about them. So um, I'm just uh, glad we're able to do that. And and if um, 
if anybody's listening and wants a copy, we didn't produce them to sell, um, but we have some copies on hand. So um, my email address is klopez at nationalreview.com, um, klopez at nationalreview.com, and, and we'd be happy to send you a copy if you were interested. That is awesome. That is awesome. We'll try to include that in our coverage, so it'll be easy for you folks to copy that and try to reach out to um, Ms. Lopez to get that um, as soon as possible. So, you know, you... I was going through some of my notes and my my prep work, and I think it's a really fascinating thing that's kind of happened as well. And and again, I'm a I've come to that I'm that little bit of that libertarian bent politician for me um, for my conservatism. But the federal government is just really not good at most things. So if you give them give them enough time, they're going to trip over their own feet. And yet again, they've right. done it with some tax code and 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 some some tax rewrites. Speak a little bit to this new issue that Congress has done with the adoption tax credit and how they've kind of muddled things up a little bit here? Sure. So, so first of all, I, I would like to re- recommend to you, Kevin Williamson had a piece, one of my colleagues last week, on the March for Life and, mm-hmm. and why it's important and why, why being pro-life is important. And he wrote it from a total libertarian point of view. Yeah. Like he's a libertarian on stuff I'm not libertarian on. And um and um and and anyway, it was just beautiful talking. It is it is it is, it is it is a great it is a great piece. I've seen that. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's okay, fantastic. Good, good, yeah. Good. Um yeah, no, I recommend it to everybody. Um and so on the adoption tax credit, um my colleague Ramesh Paniru is is the expert on all things family tax credit wise and adoption tax credit wise. So I always defer to him if you're looking for good pieces on these things. But what I was grateful to, you know, the idea behind these tax credits are to help these poor, struggling families, right, and to help these generous families who want to make more room. Um, you know, a lot of people cynically say, well, so is that like making money off kids? No, it's, it's that we're trying to promote a good here. Um, and, and sometimes government can do that. You know, some government can do terribly grave things like say that or like legalize abortion for for all three ten trimesters and even worse the court does it right um but um but sometimes with with little little um regulations and legislative moves they can make life a little bit easier for families and i think if we can make life a little bit easier for families that's something we should do um i was grateful for the republican fumble on that issue in the sense that it it created an opening to talk about adoption. Yes. Um, you know, it's an issue we don't talk about every day. So, so I, I took it as an opportunity. Um, I guess it's actually a bipartisan moment. Barack Obama had that line about every crisis being an opportunity. You know, there actually is something to that and not in a cynical kind of way. Um, but sometimes just by, by virtue of, of, of some unforced error or, Whatever it is, it, it, there is an opportunity in this news cycle to talk about something we wouldn't otherwise be talking about. It is definitely something we need to examine a lot more. And, and folks, we've talked about it. You know, my, my catchphrase is really simple. The government can permit, can promote, or prohibit. Well, we, we permit this adoption. We permit it, but we're not really promoting it. And the tax credit is one of the things we can really do to help families uh, take a financial burden off of uh, trying to do the right thing. You know, let's move, let's move the financial burden from the federal government to the individuals that are willing to carry that burden. And then let's give them a little bit of, you know, financial help along the way. So I, it's definitely an area that I think we need to spend some time. And it's great to see National Review Institute and others really focusing on that. So Catherine, as you, um, Look back at the March for Life. I know we spoke to some folks on the ground. We talked about some different other events around the country. Um, obviously, President Trump made history by speaking to the group, first president in history to do this. And obviously, the thing. Speak a little bit to the atmosphere and your experiences uh, between this march and some of the others. Um, you know, I find that every year, this year included, um, it, uh, it becomes more hopeful. Um, and there is an awful lot of hope um, every year, even even frankly the year that the Barack Obama was inaugurated, and people were feeling very dispirited about the prospects um, on um, on all matters of of pro life um, issues. Um, you know, there was last year and this year um, an added. I know a lot of people had conflict 
conflicted feelings, including myself, about um, the president speaking this year and and um, Vice President Pence not not so much because he um, he's as a congressman was there every year and and he was um, known to be a true believer and and uh, sure. Sure. Donald Trump people have mixed feelings about um, for many reasons. A lot of people do. Um, but you know what? I'm grateful that that um, whenever the office of the president and the vice president and the speaker of the house can can um, be behind this this crucial human rights issue. Um, and so there, I think there was an added um, hopefulness um, having being being able to have. Um, the the office of the president and the, and the speaker of the house weighing in um, in in support of this um, this noble cause and um, I was I was really moved by and if, um, wh- whatever one's religious tradition I think I think you might be too Cardinal Dolan from New York is the head of the outgoing head of the bishops the Catholic bishops pro life committee. And he gave um, a homily the night before the March for Life um, at my uh, by my former alma mater, Catholic University. Um, and he um, he spoke about Martin Luther King and civil rights and and um, and how how Reverend King would 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 be um, a leader of this cause um, because it was so consistent with everything um, that he was about. Um, and and the need to um, to talk about this issue and those kind of civil rights, making making a civil uh, so, a civic argument, um, in addition to um, you know many of us believe by faith this, that you know these children are created in the image and likeness of God and so we have to defend them. Well, well, I also ran into to um, atheists at the pro life march. Um, this is something that we um, we can and should and do have count common cause on. Um, and um, and I'm, I'm deeply moved every year this year included by the number of um, young people who want to be and are being creative about reaching um, reaching their their uh, their their compatriots um, their uh, their age group their friends their their classmates um, creatively and talking about talking about you know women's rights and what's what's um what's good for the individual and and just being creative about the way we talk about this because all of these things are true and so you don't have to stop with i'm pro life i'm pro choice um the polling numbers that we see every year um there's maris polling that's been commissioned by the knights of columbus for the last um over over 10 years now um, that's consistent with few polling and other polling that just shows us that the majority of the people who describe themselves as pro-choice are pro-choice because they want to know that a woman in a difficult situation has choices, right? And so once once uh, we start doing a better job as, as a pro-life movement, the pro-life movement talking about what those actual options are, if you're in a difficult situation, who is there to step up to the plate to help you? Well, then people feel will feel free to say, yeah, actually, I believe abortion is wrong. Um, but um, so so and, and and step up to the plate to support some of these groups. Um, so there, there's a I think there's a, a more confidence about this issue and more uh, desire to be creative and compelling and confident in, in talking about um, some of the options that really exist out there. Well, I couldn't agree more. I really think that the culture is really shifting very rapidly in just different ways. And the old pro-life approach, um, I, I got to be honest, even you know, visual aids of abortion, like that's just not the way the millennial generation and in, in, in going yeah. forward is it, going to be read. That's just not how they approach things. They're just going to approach things differently. Yeah. We're in an age where you know the human is like. Uh, uh, Sam Harris, for instance, is against abortion. He's like, he's a human. He's like, I believe in people. I can't go killing them. I mean, you know, so there's a, there's an avenue there to like find some common ground. You know, Scott Klusendorf okay. has been this great apologetic sort of approach to, uh, science and what's life and what's not and all that, you know, so everything is evolving very, very rapidly. You know, Ben Shapiro has really become a, a great advocate on college campuses now dealing with um, abortion and pro-life, whatever, to, to college students. And we've seen a huge shift now in, in some of those videos moving and going viral because people 
are seeing their arguments sort of debunked. And I think that's exactly what you're saying is, you know, it's, it's a different arena, a different ball game. People are being creative, they're being innovative, and, and the value of life is now being transferred to another generation. It has been a great chance to talk to Catherine Jean Lopez. We appreciate her giving her, well, get her email and all this other stuff clarified. Make sure you have what you need to reach out, connect, uh, follow National Review Institute, follow National Review online, and uh, really keep up to date on what's going on. So stay with us as we uh, go on and with a few more topics along this arena before we get into uh, some pop culture movie news at the end of the show. We have a lot of great faith-based films coming up. With